You're watching The Sovereign Life with Teresa Stewart on Channel 82. Welcome back to this episode of The Sovereign Life. I'm Terry Kay with my good friend Mandela Fubler, and we are wrapping up this episode with some of the the keys that you have, Mandela, when it comes to actually setting up the account. Now, you know, we're millennials, and we often hear our parents' generation say, if I had gotten started investing earlier, mm -hmm. then I would be much further along in my investing game than I am today. So let's just talk about, first of all, is there a good number to have set up to get started with your account? Like, what's, not necessarily the magic number, what's a good comfortable number to kind of get yourself started? So I would say, how much are you willing to start with? And you have to look at your finances, you have to look at what your monthly bills are. Um, but the best advice that I could give is just to start. Mm. Like I wish that I would have started younger um, and I wish that I would have risked more. Um, and I think a lot of people who are older feel the same way. So anything that you're willing to kind of put aside and say, you know what, I don't need this right now. I could buy a new pair of shoes, I could buy a new top, or I could put this into, you know, into a, a stock that I think is going to be around for the next 20 years and that's going to grow. Mm -hmm. um, so there's, I guess there's a difference between having a, a large balance to start off with and putting a little bit aside each month. So if you, if you are willing to put aside, let's say, $200, $500 each month, that's not going to hurt you financially. Um, and you can dollar cost average into an index, which is a lot lower risk, or into one of those staple stocks that you know are going to be around for a long time. Um, if I could probably go back, I would have taken a lot more, a lot more of my, my savings or my money that was just sitting in the bank and not collecting any interest because, you know, you want to have a rainy day fund, but you have to be realistic and say, okay, I have enough for a rainy day. This is for growth. Mm -hmm. This is really for me to try and maximize my, my, my returns. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it, it depends. Everybody's different. Everybody has their own sort of life goals. Um, but the best advice that I could give is just to start. Don't come up with excuses. Don't say, oh, I have a trip planned or once I get this amount, because you'll never get it. <laughs> Okay, man, you don't have to talk directly to me. Like, I get it. But yes, you definitely find yourself talking yourself out of certain things because you want to have this idealistic start to your investing game. And you definitely want to make sure that the, at the very least you're set up in a good way. But I definitely hear what you're saying when you say, like, you know, if you can get started today without necessarily hurting yourself financially, you should get started. But one of the things that I think kind of trips some people up is even if we have the two to 500 that we can kind of get started with today, if we wanted to do dollar cost averaging is, how do I even create the account? Like, where do I go to even get started? Because not like I can just take my 500 and go to the New York Stock Exchange and say, hey, I want to buy these stocks. Like, right. how does that kind of process work? So there are a few places in Bermuda. Um, I, I just have to be careful about what I say in, mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, um, I don't want to get myself in trouble or anybody else, but there are a few banks in Bermuda that you can go to. You can set up a brokerage account. Um, they do have certain conditions. So I think there's like a minimum. Mm. Um, and then there's also fees. So you don't want to start with $100 and the fees to buy is $50 because that's half of your money right there Gone. out the window. So do your research. Things that I like to look for are, um, you know, what are their fees? That's a big one because they're going to take a percentage. They're a business. They're trying to make money. So where, where, are, your, where are they going to be taking from your capital? Um, there's also crypto accounts or digital asset accounts. So if you're doing things like, <coughs> sorry, buying Bitcoin, that's going to be a different broker. That's going to probably be like a Coinbase or Binance. Um, there's a CEX and all those exchanges work with Bermuda. So you are able to transfer from your Bermuda account into the crypto exchange. And then when you're ready to withdraw, you can send it back to your Bermuda account. Mm -hmm. um, so in terms of getting started, I would suggest just researching a few exchanges or a few brokerages brokerage accounts. I know some people prefer the Bermuda element where they can actually speak to someone um, if you're not too fussed and you want to reduce, you know, some of that um, the time lag, then you can probably go overseas and look at some of the broker uh, brokerages over there. Mm -hmm. um, other things I would look at are um, what what's the the feedback or some of the, the comments or criticisms about them. Have people had issues withdrawing their money? That's a big red flag. 
if you can't get your money out. Um, one thing that I do whenever I set up an account, I test withdrawing. So a deposit, let's say I deposit a thousand, I'll try and withdraw twenty dollars. I want to see how fast it gets out and that it gets out, and how many, uh, how much do they charge in fees. Um, and just start, like don't don't keep putting it off, put it on a list and get it done because the faster you set up the account, the faster you can start making money. Okay, Mandela, I hear you, I get it. I, I am going to do this in the next couple of days. One of the things you mentioned earlier that I kind of wanted to circle back on was this idea of the digital asset accounts and, okay, because it's very popular right now. I mean, if people aren't talking about digital assets, they're not talking about anything. And so when you are, because I feel like that might be a little bit different for people than just the regular stock or brokerage account, because that one is, there is an element of, it's hard to get into, it's secure. Mm -hmm. There are certain things that are kind of set up for these digital assets that make them a little, that make them different from your traditional assets. So what are like what would be the key thing that you should look at when you're trying to determine which digital asset account you want to create like what is like the thing for you to kind of say okay yeah that's the one i want to create my account with okay good question a lot to unpack and i guess the first thing is what do they offer so if i want to get shiba inu which is the, one of the new kids on the block um does the exchange actually offer that not all of them do a lot of the more like tried and tested ones like I think Coinbase, for example, they don't offer a lot of the new coins. Um, so just checking the catalog and seeing the things that you want to invest in are available. Um, the next thing I'll probably look at is fees. So how much do they charge for you to buy, sell? How much do they ch charge for you to withdraw or transfer to other accounts? Um, and then another thing I look for is um, their compatibility with Bermuda. There are some um, exchanges that are basically not going to allow you to open up accounts with a Bermuda passport or Bermuda address. So those things will save you time. Mm -hmm. um, and just talking to people, I think also having like a community, if you can, of friends, like minded people who have done it, maybe have a mentor or a trading coach or like a group that you can bounce ideas off of. Um, one of the things I tell people is I have over 20 years of mistakes <laughs> of investing, of what not to do, of where I went wrong. Um, Bitcoin went from, I want to say, let's say March 2020, Bitcoin crashed. Um, it went down to three grand and I tried to go to sleep and I couldn't because I just kept thinking about my Bitcoin. So I got up at two in the morning and I sold it, all of it. I had more than three. And then the next morning I looked at it and it was up and it never went to three grand again. So being able to have these conversations with people and to say, yeah, I made a mistake, but you know what? I'm never doing that again. And the next time I feel like selling Bitcoin, I'm going to think twice. Right. Um, and sharing that with people so that the next time um, that happens, someone can say, oh, yeah, I remember that guy on that TV show said, you know, he, he wishes he hadn't he hadn't sold it. Right. Um, so being able to have that human contact, which is rare during COVID uh, or since COVID, we really haven't had that. Um, and trying your best to kind of just navigate investing. I don't have all the answers, but I'm helping you know as many people as I can to learn from my mistakes. And I think learning from, not only you learning from your own mistakes, but sharing it with other people to learn from those mistakes is very important because I feel like this space is somewhat guarded. Like getting into investing is not the easiest thing to do because it's not a topic that gets talked about in your education. It's definitely something that genuinely comes out of like these, just we have a connection, we have like-minded conversations. And so that's great. So can we just talk about quickly, why do we think this space is so guarded? Like, why is it that it's very difficult to get into if you don't have $10,000 in a, your capital to get started? Like, why is it so closed off? Yeah, um, it's a tricky one because I think some of it is self-inflicted. So I think a lot of people feel like they don't want to get into investing until they're older. Um, that's an older person's thing. I, I'll think about investing when I'm retired. Mm -hmm. um, but the best time to invest is when you're younger and you have the capital, you have the time to invest and, and, and grow um, as much as possible. Um, I think the other thing is a lot of the institutions that are set up are making money on fees. So they will make more money from someone who is just 
giving them some money to invest than they would if someone goes overseas, let's say, and is investing on their own. Mm-hmm. So there's a little bit of a discouragement there. Um, there's a lack of education. So in the school system, you don't have a lot um a lot of people focused in on investing specifically. You have people doing MBAs or business degrees or things kind of, some overlap. Um, but it, when it gets down to like technical analysis or crypto investing, there's very limited, reliable um, educational resources. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I guess the last thing is people are so busy right now. People want um, immediate gratification. So a lot of people don't want to spend the time to read or to listen to podcasts. They want to know what's the ticker symbol? When do I buy? When am I making a grand? Or, yeah. you know, give, just give me the, the, the quick summary. Give me the executive summary um, and I'll do it. I want to know the secret to investing. Tell me. <laughs> um, and it's not like it's, it's just over 20 years. I've kind of learned that the secret is, yeah, it's just hard work. Yeah. It's like delayed gratification is patience. Mm hmm. It's um, just putting in the time. I mean, like take any any sort of hobby that you have, whether it be, let's say it's filmmaking. I used to love filmmaking. Um, I love the studio. Studio brings back some good memories. Um, but you're not gonna just buy a camera and be able to make a show. Mm-hmm. You're gonna actually have to learn, okay, how do I light the set? How do I edit? How do I get lower thirds? How do I, you know, it's a lot of things that go on in the background to get you to that point. Same with investing. It's going to take a lot of work and you have to accept that Mm -hmm. Um, if you want to do it right. There are going to be people who who are going to get lucky. Mm -hmm. So you always have someone who is like beginner's luck where you you have a nice little hundred grand year. Mm -hmm. Um, But if you want to be in it for the long haul, then you're going to have to pull up your sleeves. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to do the work just like you would with anything else, any other career. Now, earlier we talked about briefly the emotional part that kind of comes into making an, a, an, a trade. You get yeah. emotionally invested in it. If it goes up or down, yeah. you definitely feel that. Quickly, can you explain like some strategies to kind of keep your mindset and your emotions in check outside of just doing the journaling? Because I know there are some other t- techniques that we can do to kind of keep us so that we don't just go sell that Bitcoin at 2 a.m. in the morning and then kick ourselves later. Worst decision. And you know, the funny thing was my wife actually told me to wait until the morning. And she was like, you know what? Maybe you just want to think about it. And I was like, what do you know? Like, I'm, I'm going to do this. This is, this is my decision. And anyway, um, so yeah, I, I always listen to her. <laughs> Um, since, that, one. since that day. Um, so some of tech techniques. So one of the things I like to do is instead of just jumping in, like impulse buying, I will intentionally take at least one hour of thought and to kind of watch what's happening. Because I find even if I wait an hour and it goes up or it goes in my direction, I can still make a more educated and informed decision. If it goes down after that hour, then I'm getting a discount, I'm getting a better price. Mm -hmm. Um, Another thing that I do sometimes is um, I'll try and look and see what other people are posting online. Um, And I usually do the opposite Mm -hmm. of whatever they're doing. (laughs) Um, That's a kind of a nice trick. Or whatever CNBC is saying, do the exact opposite (laughs) um, because chances are they're probably late to the party and everybody's already made their money. Mm -hmm. Um, Resources wise, I would suggest like podcast like um, there's one called um, pre market prep. Yeah. So that's every day they give you maybe 30, 40 symbols that are in play or that are topical. So it could be earnings announcements. It could be CEOs um, doing things. Um, It just gives you a pulse Mm -hmm. on what's happening. Um, And it's a free resource. Mm -hmm. Um, The only other thing I would say is is actual like I was talking about the hard work Mm -hmm. screen time. So you actually looking at charts is helpful Mm -hmm. because you can rely back on it later and say, okay, I remember the last time it spiked up like that. It went right back down like the Eiffel Tower Mm -hmm. and I lost money. So I'm not going to chase it again. Mm -hmm. So just put it in the time and trying to learn from your mistakes as hard or as as silly or simple as that sounds. I think that's one of the keys to kind of being successful in the long term. And as we wrap up, Mandela, I know you have you've mentioned podcasts and books this whole episode. So do you have any other specific books and podcasts that you want to recommend? Because I do know that if 
someone is watching this episode, they're definitely like, okay, what podcast should I listen to besides pre-market prep? Right. Okay. So one that I like is Market Huddle. Um, Kevin Muir and uh, Patrick Ceresna. Mm-hmm. They do a lot more stocks based, but it's it's good quality and they they have experience in the industry. Um, the other ones I like are um, Macro Voices. Mm-hmm. So that's more like big picture, long term investing. Like what themes are doing well? More like three four years. Uh, sorry, three four months. Um, if you're looking at that sort of longer term perspective. Um, books wise, the Market Wizards books, it's good for psychology. And then the last one I'm reading now is called The Mental Game by Jared Tedler. Um, and it focuses only on your mental, um, basically your mental strength. So when you're trading, how are you managing that trade? Are you getting in or out um, you know, uh, at the right times? Mm-hmm. And how to improve on your mental strength. Those sound like all great resources, Mandela. I am grateful to you for that because I'm going to make sure I go purchase them and listen to some of this. Thank you so much for watching this episode of The Sovereign Life. We just share with you the Invest in Blueprint to build generational wealth. And one thing you can make sure you do is share this episode with someone in your circle because we all need to be having this conversation with each other more frequently because that is how we're going to build generational wealth. Thanks so much for watching this episode and we see you in the next one. You've been watching The Sovereign Life. Hope you enjoyed the show. Thanks for watching.